This is a book that I use for entrepreneurs. When they say that they want to become an entrepreneur, I say, please read this first, and then we'll, yes. we'll talk. Uh, because he, uh, he outlines what's ahead. He does a great job of translating legalese into real English. And um, his second book, which uh, I have a copy in the back, which I'll bring, is called Winning the Game. So if you are a business owner and you want to sell, this is for entrepreneurs starting to want to start. His second book, Winning the Game, uh, is all about how you structure yourself and the process of uh, selling your business. So um, uh, it's, it's a fantastic book. I have both of them. And, uh, they're, they're very helpful. So, without regard, without more, more trouble, you go ahead and start, man. Uh, I do. So, let me start by uh, just giving you a two-minute version on who I am so you can decide whether you want to listen or not. And then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then we're going to jump right into it. So, the very quick take on me, uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm an adjunct professor. I do only transactional work, corporate finance. I uh, was lucky enough to start my career before the dot-com age at Pillsbury, Madison, and Sutro. Uh, it, we called them PMS. And then I switched, <laughs> I switched firms to Morrison and Forrester, and they were known as MoFo. So I decided after that I couldn't do another big firm. The Lord knows what I'd have to call myself. Uh, did six billion with the BE work of mergers and acquisitions, did a bunch of venture work, jumped over to one of my clients, Evoke Software, to be their general counsel. We were six months out from going public, and I jumped in March 2001, which was the first of the first dot-com bubble. Yes! Awesome. Um, I, I was kidding, Chris, I, I don't do PowerPoints because I'm afraid to turn the lights down, because as a lawyer, the odds of me putting you to sleep are high. So thank God for the lights. Um, I also uh, moved down to LA from San Francisco to work at Technicolor at their DVD division. Was the lead lawyer for it. We're doing about two, three billion worth of uh, revenue. And then uh, did the lawyer hat trick and started my own firm. And now I'm a two lawyer firm located in Encino. And half of my work is working with startups and startup investors. The other half is continuing to do mergers and acquisitions. Our little shop does about a dozen to 15 acquisitions a year. Uh, I teach venture law uh, three out of the last four years at Loyola Law School. So if you want me to crank it up and give you the graduate school experience, we can certainly do that. Uh, so my intention for you this morning, Chris had asked me to go through the basics on the understanding that some of you are newer members uh, with Pasadena. So I intend to teach you the basics of equity. I'm gonna tell you about the different forms of equity, what the features are, do a little bit of compare and contrast. And then I'm gonna walk you through a term sheet. Um, I know from conversations with Chris uh, that you guys are, are using or at least occasionally use the ACE term sheet. I'm gonna be playing off the NBCA, the National Venture Capital Association term sheet. But we're gonna walk through each of the elements of the term sheet explain what your options are in the menu when you're building term sheets and then uh, at that point you'll be exhausted and it'll be time for you to go home. So <laughs> that is my plan. Uh, so uh, with no further ado, uh, I'm going to start you off with equity investment basics for angels. So if you take a look at that, we get cranking. So uh, before, before we are finished with this deck, you will have learned about common stock, preferred stock. You'll learn about convertible securities, so warrants, convertible notes, safes, and options. Uh, and at that point, you'll be extremely dangerous. Uh, so if you already know some of this stuff, uh, humor those of you that are newer. Uh, and you, you may uh, find out that something that you thought was true might actually be different. So hopefully you'll pick up some nuggets, even if you are experienced. Right? So uh, one thing that was not on the list was membership interests. So first, I want to talk about LLCs briefly. Uh, from the for the most part, what I teach at Loyola is that startups that are LLCs 
angel investors might be interested in investing in them, obvious criteria. If the startup team is great and they have a great idea, you're going to invest, you know, whether they're an LLC, a C Corp or, you know, whatever invention that we've come up with lately. But I try to tell the students that if you're guiding a startup at the get go, the better thing to do is to take your startup straight into a corporation and sell stock instead of using the LLC deal. And the logic for that, as we teach it at Loyola, is as funny as it is to say, the LLC is kind of a new creature. Uh, it, it originally blinked into existence in Wyoming, of all places. People wanted to do oil uh, and gas partnerships and they didn't want the tax treatment, they didn't want the rigmarole of the escort, and they decided, could we have some new thing? And with the oil industry having the captive legislature in Wyoming, came up with the limited liability company that had all of the liability protection of a corporation, but had massive flexibility like the partnership. So that was a little niche thing. And then other states started picking up on it. And I actually worked with one of the guys at Pillsbury that sat on a committee in California to create LLCs in the 90s here. That being said, from a lawyer's perspective, an LLC is a really new creature. And so there's risk with people. Uh, you know, 20, 25 years doesn't sound like news, but from the perspective of being able to deal with Delaware case law, and statutes that have been around for over a hundred years, any version of a movie that you might have seen on a shareholder dispute or a board fight or you know a poison pill, that's been covered a hundred different times by Delaware, New York, California. When it comes to the LLCs, we don't have a lot of case law because they haven't been around now. And we also find that Delaware just cannot stop monkeying with the statutes when it comes to the LLC structure. So from an investment standpoint, not something that I would recommend to my clients. If they come to me and they've already done an LLC, God bless, we'll make it work. And when the time comes, we're gonna flip them into a C-Corp so that they can become more investable. That being said, let me just spend two minutes talking about terminology so that if you run into an LLC and you really, really want to do it, you understand what it is that you're doing. So there is no stock in a limited liability company. And it is company, it's not corporation. It's not a corporation, it's a limited liability company. I had an iBanker send me a term sheet yesterday for an acquisition and wanted to tell me that Target was a limited liability corporation. No, it's a limited liability company. You don't get stock, you get membership interest. It's, and remember, from a tax standpoint, they're thinking about this like a partnership. So what would you have in a partnership? You'd have a partnership interest. So here, we don't talk about partners. That would confuse people and make them think it's a partnership. We have members, not stockholders, members. And we get a membership interest. It usually gets expressed as a percentage that sometimes <coughs> confuses unsophisticated folks. So when I have a client come to me with an LLC, we'll take the membership interest 100% and we'll bust them into units, a thousand units for every percentage point. So now I can say we have a hundred thousand units and it feels more like stock, but it's still the equivalent of a partnership interest. With an LLC, the things that you're used to in a corporation, you're not gonna see. So you're not gonna see articles and bylaws. There is no shareholder agreement. The unsophisticated will sometimes talk about a partnership agreement because we wanna to dare to be different. It's an operating agreement. And you don't get stock certificates. Again, there's no stock. You don't get a membership interest certificate. All you do is you look at that operating agreement and on the back should be a schedule that lays out either what your percentage interest is or how many units you have. Now, one of the things that people in California in the 90s, when they started with the statute, liked about the LLC was you can mirror stock concepts. So as an angel investor, you want founders to get common stock, you want preferred stock. You can do that in an LLC. The founder members can get common units. The sophisticated investors can ask for a series A preferred ones. And you can make it dance and sing like the term sheet that we're gonna talk about in the next hour. So massive flexibility. 
sounds like a positive, just understand that there's some risk there. So enough about LLC. Let's talk about the more common structures that you're going to be used to seeing when you talk with startup managers. So common stock. I just want to make sure that everybody understands what common stock is versus what preferred stock is. And for the folks in the back of the room, this is probably going to be most helpful to you. So common stock is exactly what it sounds like. One share of common stock has the same rights as every other share of common stock. One share equals one vote. In terms of vocabulary, and again, this will be helpful for the folks in the back of the room. Lawyers, we love our terminology because it confuses you and then you have to pay us to explain it. Um, I'm going to explain it really simply. So how does common stock come into existence? When a company files the Articles of Incorporation, Certificate of Incorporation, whatever you want to call it, Usually it's a one sheet piece of paper. It's very simple. It's the name of the company. It's the number of authorized shares. There's some indemnification language. Maybe you put in the initial directors and then sign here and incorporator, send it in and it's done. Now, why, why the authorized shares? What that does is that causes the shares to legally exist from the standpoint of being on a shelf. So the way that I describe it to first time entrepreneurs when I teach at the LA Venture Association is authorized shares, they, they don't exist yet. All they are is they're available for issuance. So if you're a startup, you wanna have something like 10 million authorized shares. Sometimes people will be silly and they will do 10,000 shares off which means if you try to hire an engineer and you want to give them an option for 1% of the company, you're going to tell them, I'm giving you an option for 100 shares. He goes, what? I got an offer from Google for 40,000 shares. <laughs> now, never mind, that's 40,000 out of 10 billion, and you're giving him 1%, which is huge, and he's getting 0.00001% at Google. But, you know, I, I had a, a friend her son was a uh, University of Pennsylvania Ivy League engineer. And he was asking me, well, this one startup company is gonna give me an option for 30,000 shares, and they're a little bigger, but the other ones can offer me 40,000 shares, which is the better deal? I'm like, well, you gotta tell me out of how many shares. So you optically, you wanna have a large number of authorized shares to solve for that problem. It's more of a morale kind of thing. but. The authorized shares, they don't exist yet. They're on the shelf, they're ready to come down. Now, what if you didn't consult a lawyer and you're a startup and you issued all 10 million shares to yourself? Oops, now you would like to issue some shares to these folks. How does that work? Well, all you do is you amend the charter. So if you filed articles of incorporation, you got it wrong, you authorized 10,000 shares, you meant to authorize 10 million. You just amend it. You have to send in a filing with another check to the state of California, and then bang, they automatically appear on the shelf. That's authorized common stock. They don't actually exist until the shares are issued. So the board that's now been appointed after the company blinks into existence, the board has to approve the sale and issuance of shares. So Ken Merchant up here is gonna buy 10,000 shares of common stock because you're giving him a ridiculously great valuation. Normally he know be knows better than that, and he'll only buy preferred stock. That's coming in about 10 minutes. So if you do that, the board will authorize a purchase agreement with Ken. Ken will write you a check, and you as the board will agree that that purchase is valid, and then the board agrees to issue him those shares. So now the shares are still authorized, they're part of the pool, if they're not authorized, if you only had 10,000 authorized and you try and you issued all 10,000 to yourself, and then you try to sell him 10,000, those are invalid. And future investors could challenge that issue. And even though you have his money, he doesn't really have stock. So the angels will do diligence to make sure that they understand whether your shares that you're selling them are actually authorized. So when you issue the shares to them, they're now issued and outstanding. Not because they're outstanding, but because they're actually, not only have they been issued, but they're out in the wild now. 
So they're, they, they fully exist. So his shares are now authorized, issued, and outstanding. If you decide to uh, sell Gary Awad a warrant, which we're gonna talk about what that is, that is not stock. It's the right to buy stock. However, you need to take some of the shares of the authorized common stock off the shelf. You're not gonna give them to Gary because he hasn't paid for them. He paid for a warrant. He needs to pay for the shares. So you're gonna take those shares off the authorized shelf and put them in a bucket. They're gonna be reserved shares. They're not issued and outstanding. They're not in the wild like Ken's shares because he paid for them full value. But Gary's are gonna sit and wait in the bucket. So we don't give them to anybody else because we don't want a double promise. Gary doesn't want a double promise. He wants to know that they're there if and when he writes you a check. But they don't exist yet. Then the last term, and this is the most important term for everybody in the room, is fully diluted shares. And so what does fully diluted mean? Well, if the founders have 10,000 shares and Ken Merchant has 10,000 shares, Gary doesn't have 10,000 shares, but he has the right to buy them. So if Chris Wadden wants to buy after all of this has happened, Chris doesn't want to buy 20% of what exists today, he wants to buy 20% of everything that could exist, including those <laughs> warrant shares. So Chris doesn't want to know the issued and outstanding number. That's nice to know, but he wants to know the fully diluted shares, the number of shares that do exist, plus the number of shares that could exist if everybody exercised everything they have a right to. So when investors talk to you as a founder, they're going to ask for the fully diluted number. Now you won't look like a deer in headlights. Uh, and now those of you that are newer investors also know, don't care about the issue not standing. We need to know the fully diluted number so we don't get smoked. What could go wrong from an angel standpoint if you don't ask for that? Well, 20,000 shares outstanding, if you got 20% of that, that's 4,000 shares-ish. You gotta gross it up, right? But you, if he ends up exercising, now you own 4,000 out of 34,000 shares. Oops, not 20%. Doesn't match your investment thesis on how you're trying to get your internal rate of return. The whole, the math goes upside down. So you gotta have the fully diluted number. So who gets, yeah? Two questions. Is there a difference, is, is there a difference between issued and outstanding? Uh, issued means that uh, that you sold the shares. Uh, outstanding means that uh, they're now in existence. They're it, they're available to be purchased. Could they be issued and not outstanding? Uh, you know, I mean, they, practically speaking, they use the same. It, it's pretty damn close. Yeah. So um, yeah. And the second question. You know, please. You mentioned reserved. You gave warrants as an example. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm using that as an initial example, but we're going to go over warrant safes and options. <coughs> Aren't treasury shares issued but not outstanding? Uh, that's a good for, for a while. Uh, so here's, thank you for solving my problem. So, um, so Patrick, uh, imagine that Ken buys his shares, they're issued and outstanding. Then the company elects to buy Ken's shares back. So they're still out there, they exist, but they now go into treasury instead of just going right back onto the shelf. So they go into a separate bucket waiting to be re resold. Thank you. Okay, so who gets common stock? So common stock is always for founders. Uh, y Combinator and some others have been trying to push a concept of founders preferred stock, which gives me a really bad migraine. Um, it, it just doesn't even make sense to me. But the idea, I guess, is that if I'm not a first time entrepreneur, but I'm someone that's been around the block a bunch of times, I wanna make sure that I get a juice on my return later. If I were the Pasadena Angels, I would just fight the whole founders preferred stock thing like a wolf. Um, it, it just conceptually doesn't make sense. That now come back out of the back alley. Common stock is essentially for founders. 
It's also for employees and it can be for friends and family. So Uncle Phil, the dentist who lives next door to you. Uh, it could be for angel investors if you're getting a ridiculously sweet uh, valuation. But generally, uh, common stock is the bottom rung of the ladder for investors. And as angels, you're going to be looking more for preferred stock. So, yeah. Okay. How common, no pun intended, how <laughs> common is it? Or have you ever seen any precedent for a company go through the process of dilution for common and no I haven't seen it, but I can imagine the scenario. Uh, if you're investing in a company and the guy's, the founder's last name is Zuckerberg, uh, you may decide that you're willing to forego your normal request for preference just to be able to get in. Uh, but boy, that sounds like a rarity. Uh, I'd be looking for preferred. Good question. Okay, so turn the page with me and let's talk about preferred stock. So, Common stocks for employees, it's for founders, it's for Uncle Phil. Let's talk about uh, what's best for the Pasadena Angels. So we like preferred stock all day and night. Uh, why do we call it preferred stock? Because it has a preference over common stock. So preferred stock in the 50s and 60s started out as being the equivalent of debt. Uh, some large public companies, you'll still see preferred stock being sold. That's a debt-like instrument. What it, what it means is I buy a share of preferred stock in Exxon, and I know that I'm going to get an 8% uh, return, which was 18, 8% return on the amount of stock that I have. And then at some point, Exxon has the right to call that preferred stock and buy it back from me, which if you think about it, that sounds an awful lot like a loan. I loan you 10,000, five years later, you get it repaid with interest, preferred stock. That, that then morphed over time. And now there are two key features to preferred stock. There's economic rights and there's protected rights. So turn the page with me. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about economic rights. So the most obvious one is liquidation preference. And if some of this gets by you, you know, hey, it's Saturday morning. Uh, I will be covering it in more depth uh, a little bit later when I do the term sheets, but I'm gonna focus on some of the, the uh, more uh, graduate version uh, extra features. The liquidation preference is a request to get your money back first if there's a liquidation event. So. <coughs> Before we get deep into liquidation preferences, what the heck is liquidation? Does that mean my company just went bankrupt? No, no, no. Liquidation preference in the mergers and acquisitions world is you had an exit. So either the company went public, yay, that's a liquidation event, or the company got sold, that's also a liquidation event, yay. So the founders will be telling us a story that if you give me a million dollars, I will guarantee you we will have a $40 million exit, to which you say, that sounds great. So then you won't mind if I get my million back off the top, and then I get to share all the way down on my percentage. So if I buy 20% of the company, I'd like a million off the top, and then the 39 million delta, 40 million minus the one I just got back, I would like 20% of the 39 million. So the liquidation preference means on the sale of a company, we have a preference, we would like our money back. And they say, well, gosh, what if we only sell the company for a million? And the answer is, well, do you believe your own story? Because if you do, it's mouse nuts to you for me to take my million back. If you're worried about it, maybe I should be worried. <laughs> so that's how that conversation typically goes. So that's the basic of what a liquidation preference is. Now let's talk about some of the extra features that come with it. So in overheated times uh, where you're looking at a VR company and it's white hot and everybody's competing with you to get in, you're probably gonna ask for one times your money back. So you put in a million, you like to get a million back off the top. If you've got a company that, heaven forbid, wants to do a social network, what are we in 1999 again? Uh, but it's hot enough that you want to invest in it, you might ask for 
a multiple of your liquidation preference. So in 2008, it was easy to ask for a two or three times multiple back. Well, 40 million, okay, I, you could get there, but you know, I'm kind of worried about whether that's going to work out. You're a lot riskier than the VR company. How about giving me three, three million back off the top, and then I'll be happy to do it. So as an angel, if you're in an auction and there are a bunch of people trying to get in on this startup, you're going to speak with a soft voice, go with a low multiple. If you're the only show in town, you might ask for a higher multiple. There's some strategy, though, that you got to be careful on how greedy you get with asking for really aggressive terms. And we're going to talk about that in the term sheet section. But just the quick hint is remember, if you're coming in as the Series A, guess what the Series B, C, and D are going to ask for? They're going to ask for that plus. So ultimately, you may end up hosing yourself because everybody else is going to ask for a three or four times multiple. So just to clarify, the, the, whether it's 1x or some multiple, that, um, that comes out, that is subtracted from the- Right off the top. Yep. But you don't double dip. You don't get your 3x We're going to talk about that next. So that's a good question. That's a perfect lead-in. One, one question back then. I'm going to keep Maybe it's the same question, but so do I get on a, on a, say a, a just a 1x liquidation event, do I get, I get 20%. Do I get my million plus 20% of what's left over, or do I get 20% but no less than a million? This is great. You guys are hungry for the next page. So let's look at it. I'm going to answer that question right now. So, uh, so what I tell the law students is with liquidation preferences, there's two P words you got to know, priority and participation. So priority means I want my million off the top. Whatever my preference is, 1 million, 2 million, 10 million, I want it off the top. I want priority over all the shareholders selling. The next question is participation. Once I take my million dollars off the top, how much and how far do I get to participate? So three flavors of ice cream here. There's non-participating, which means I get my million dollars and that's it. That would be like the East Coast model, the Exxon model, of this is just debt. So pay me my, my principal back and we're done. You guys aren't gonna wanna do non-participating at all. So you could do the next two flavors ice cream, you could do fully participating, or you could do capped participation. So fully participating is exactly what it sounds like. So you've asked me in the back for a million dollars, I'm being a nice guy today, so I'm only asking for a 1X on my liquidation preference. So I'm gonna take a million off the top. <coughs> I would like fully participating, which means whether the company sells for 10 million or 50 million or a billion, I own 20% of the company, a billion minus 1 million, 999 million. I, I would like to be able to get 20% of that. So I want fully participating. I'm going all the way down the elevator with them. Now, as, uh, as a founder, the sophisticated founder, or at least the founder that has sophisticated counsel, will argue, you know, hey, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> appreciate your money, happy to give you that, that 1x or God forbid 2x. But, you know, the whole fully participating thing, at some point, how much is enough, guys? So if, if we get a billion dollars, do you really need to nick me for a million off the top? Come on. That's kind of ridiculous. How about if we have capped participation, which means, okay, if I only manage to get to 40 million, you can keep your million. But if we go north of 40 million, 50 million, whatever it is you and I agree is the cap, then you gotta give away the liquidation preference. That's, that's just silly and unfair, you're being greedy. So what I would like you to do you're not going to actually convert your preferred, but we're going to pretend as if you convert your preferred into common stock for the purpose of calculating who gets what on the sale of the company. So you'll have a choice. If we sell for a billion dollars, you can get your damn million off the top, but you're going to be capped at only getting 20% down to 40, and then you aren't getting any more. That's it. So that'll be the world's easiest decision. You're going to decide, okay, never mind, it's a billion dollars. I don't want to leave, you know, 
$180 million on the table that I could get from my 20%, I'm willing to convert into common, waive my right to the liquidation preference in order to share in the 20% all the way down the ladder. So not participating, all you get is your 1 million back plus maybe dividends. Fully participating, I'm eating all the way down the ladder. Capped participation, at some negotiated level, we agree that I'll give away my liquidation preference. And if you were in my law school class, we'd do a whole bunch of math on the board, but it's Saturday morning and I don't want to do it to you. Um, there's a little bit of it in the book, but uh, you can, you, you're going to be, as investors, calculating an internal rate of return, trying to figure out if I give Sally DeWitt's company a million dollars and I think her exit's going to be in seven years and I could have invested in Chevron and knew that that thing would go up 10% every year, no matter how much oil they spill, plus I get paid to hold it with dividends, that equaled this amount. What do I need to feel good about the amount of risk that I'm gonna take by investing in this startup? And how long do I need that to compound to get me to the seven year mark? And you'll figure out, okay, what I really need for my million dollars is I need 4 million back in seven years based on the internal rate of return. So if they sell for anything north of 55 million, mathematically, I know that I'll get, I, I will still need that protection on the liquidation preference. Anything north of 55 million, I know that I'm guaranteed to get my internal rate of return. So at that point, I'm willing to let the cap come off. So you'll do some math, but it'll get you to that place. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, on your cap participation, you're talking about a percentage, but can't you also just use a dollar figure too? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm using two numbers and I'm toggling back and forth, so sorry if I confused you. No. The, the two numbers that I'm worried about are what's my percentage ownership of the company? And I'm using that to calculate my internal rate of return, which tells me the dollar number I want to insert for the cap. So if if I figure that once I get once the company sells for fifty five million, only twenty percent of everything north of that is a better deal for me than having my one million liquidation preference. That's mathematically where I'm going to agree. That's the cap. I'm going to. It's an easy decision. I'm going to defer. Okay. Uh, other questions on that one? Okay. Yeah, Stan. So the cap is not the cap of what we get back, it's the cap of the valuation of the, of the transaction. Yeah, if, if you're not paying attention, it's the cap on what you get. <laughs> yeah. So if you're paying attention and you've done the math and you know where your tipping point is, then you're gonna know if we get to that point, I'm flipping and I'm gonna do a conversion. So, uh, and then the next point here was just to remind me to say conversion to you. So again, it's a deemed conversion. You're not going to convert the common stock. You're gonna keep that preferred stock, but you're gonna agree that it can be treated as if it converted for the liquidation preference purposes. Okay, so that was the big economic rate. Now let's talk about the juice. So let's talk about dividends. So. This will always confuse your first time entrepreneur. They're gonna to wanna to know, wait a minute, we have no money. That's why we're asking you for money. And we plan on spending, losing, you no, know, spending your money. And so we, why would we be paying you a dividend? That makes no sense. Well, no guys, we're not gonna ask for an actual dividend. What we're gonna ask for is an accrued dividend. And the idea is that the entrepreneur, again, is telling us, give me a million dollars, I'm gonna get you to 40, no sweat. And you say, great. Well, you know, I'm not gonna be mean, I'm not gonna ask you for a 2X liquidation preference, because, you know, I'm, I'm a nice guy. But what I would like to do is to make sure that I get close to my internal rate of return. So I would like a dividend to accrue on top of the liquidation preference. So you're telling me we're gonna get in and out of this thing in five years, great. What if it takes 10 years? What if it takes 15 years? A million dollars back, that sucks. Right. So I wanna make sure that I get a million back plus 
And where did I pull that number from? Pretty much everybody uses 8%. They have no idea why, but <laughs> we all love 8%. Sometimes you'll see six, sometimes you'll see 10. Those are people that I guess dare to be different, but <laughs> most, most people are using 8%. So it's not an actual dividend. In 2018, the company will not issue you a dividend. But what they will do is when we get to 2020 and we sell the company, everybody's going to break out their calculators to figure out how much the angels are getting off the top for their series. A. Yeah. So the intent of the dividend is it's not to change valuations, it's to introduce the time. It's to juice the liquidation profits. So instead of getting a million dollars back, we want 1.08 or yeah, we want need 1.16. You, you could. The valuation doesn't change over time, it just changes over time. Right. All right. So the other question is, is the rate subject to, I guess, usury laws that varies by state? Yeah, but the usury laws tend to be pegged around 18%. So, you know, if you start getting obnoxious, you might trip over it. But if you stick with that 8% metric, you know, you're never going to get yourself in trouble. Good question. Stan? Does the accrual go against the, uh, the financials of the company? Is that it's a liability for them? Uh, it's, it's, it's possible. I, I've never seen it done. Um, but, you know, I suppose, you know, as a technical matter, it, it could be, you know, again, it's like quasi debt. So you're, you're talking about equity and my instinct would be the reason that I'm not seeing it is because you're talking about an equity feature. Um, you're shaking your head. You may know more than I do from an accounting perspective. I don't think it's constant. Yeah. Because it's, because it's equity. Because it's, it's a future payable. It's not, it's not a guarantee. Yeah. Right. And you know, yeah, because it, 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 unlike debt, where I'm guaranteed to get eight percent, the company could get sold for ten dollars. So now you've accrued this liability that never shows up. There was another question, Patrick. On that point, one of the eight or nine companies in this company wanted to give me a ten ninety nine gross profit. I think it was a ten ninety nine. No, you're not a contractor. You're not working. You're a passive investor. That's not whatever it was. Should, yeah. should I expect to have to get something that says I've accrued this dividend? No, pay tax on it. No. Well, that's what I told them. Yeah. No. They went away. Yeah, it, it went away because they didn't know what they were talking about. Um, you know, if their accountant wants to talk to your accountant, that's lovely, but they need to pay for your accountant's fees. I, I, I wouldn't be wasting my brain cells on that. Does it compound? So that's actually the next topic. So um, there's uh, different types of dividends. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, I'm gonna talk to you about priority and I'm gonna talk to you about participation again, just like we talked about with liquidation preferences. So on liquidation preferences, remember, I want my money off the top, priority, Participation, I want to see how far down the ladder I can get on feeding on the rest of the proceeds. Same thing is true with dividends. If I have preferred stock, it's got a preference over the common. If the board, and it's controlled by founders, wants to issue a dividend to the common, that sounds lovely. But if they're actually going to issue a dividend because we have money, then as a preferred holder, I want my 8% first. So I want that off the top. That would be a priority. And then the next question is participation. So if I get my 8% for my 10,000 shares of Series A preferred, do I, also get, do I also get to feed on whatever the dividend is to the common stockholders? So that would be a negotiation, but you'd feel real stupid if they were gonna uh, do a dividend of uh, $10 to the common stock and you got eight cents. Um, that wouldn't work real well. So normally you're gonna ask for participation. You get your 8% priority, and then you get your participation on the rest of the actual dividend. But we were talking about accrued dividends, and the question up front was, do I get them on a cumulative basis or not? And the answer is, it's totally negotiable, but I will tell you that from a market standard, uh, West Coast deals, we don't seem to be asking for those. East Coast, they tend to get them a little bit more, again, because they got this debt uh, mindset from investing in hardware. 
Um, so they, they view it, you know, like a, a loan. Here we view it more as an equity investment. And so cumulative, you'll get them on five to 10% of the deals. But, you know, if the lawyers on the other side representing the company know what they're doing, they're going to push back and tell you that cumulative is not market. Um, for those of you that may not have heard that term before, so simple interest is if I loan you a million dollars every year, I'm going to get $80,000 worth of interest if I'm getting 8%. So that, that 80,000 never changes. It's static. If I'm getting compounded interest, you're not going to, you know, you're going to do a balloon payment. You're going to pay me nothing until five years. But at the end of five years, I want my 8%, but I want it compounded. I don't want 80,000 a year. Because if you'd have paid me in year one, I could have used that money to buy Chevron stock, but you didn't. I had to reloan it to you. So why wouldn't I get 8% on top of the $80,000? So that's where it starts jacking. And instead of paying me 1 million plus $400,000, 80 times five years, you're gonna end up paying me closer to 2 million or two and a half million by the time the interest keeps getting calculated on top of the interest. Yeah. Are, are the dividends convertible, like a mini convertible note on top of the investment or is it just cash? No, um, the, the dividend only comes in uh, if uh, the board agrees to pay it or there's a liquidation event. So on a liquidation event, you'll get not your million dollars back on the liquidation preference, but you get a million plus either the simple interest dividend or the cumulative dividend. Um, so, uh, the, the dividend the capital, your participation, the just more because you, I'm sorry, say again? You know, does the di getting dividends affect your participation because they say a million dollars was 20%, now you're getting No, it, it wouldn't. More. It's, it's only, it's only if there's a cap. If there's a cap, then, uh, the amount of the liquidation preference is irrelevant to the company. It's relevant to you on calculating your internal rate of return to decide if you want to flip or not for the cap. Because if, if you need, in order to give away your liquidation preference, you would have flipped at 55 million, but you managed to get accrued dividends, you might not be willing to give away that liquidation preference until you get to 56 million. So that's another place where you really do, to Stan's question earlier, you know, gee, if it's if it's 50 million, that's the the cap. I guess I automatically flip if it goes to 50 million and a dollar. Maybe not, because if the company didn't exit at five years, they exited at 10 years. You had the dividend spending. Redo the math, and you may find that oops, I actually don't want to flip until 57 because I'm leaving 50 thousand dollars on the table. Don't want to do that. So, so that's a, a good question. But yeah, whether, whether I'm getting a million or a million eighty back, uh, that won't change the cap, but it will change my decision on whether I want to flip. Okay. Excuse me, I have a yeah. question. Please. Um, the latter, latter question on compounding. Cumulative and compounding dividend. I'm sorry? Is the dividend on the preferred stock is not a compounded, it's cumulative, right? Right. Uh, well, there's compounding and there's cumulative. So thank you for that question. So let me clarify that. So there's compound interest, but there's also cumulative dividends. So if you're not careful and you say uh, that, uh, that you are going to have a dividend on your liquidation preference, but it's non-cumulative, what that would mean is if the company gets sold in, in 2018 and you've got 8% interest on your liquidation preference, that's what you're getting. If the next year goes by, you're not going to get 8% plus 8%. It's non-cumulative. It's not going to keep adding. So thank you for that. I, I was mixing and matching terms. I shouldn't. Compounding is the interest jacking up the way I was describing it. Cumulative, if you don't have cumulative, the compounding isn't really going to help you. The, the cumulative means every year that goes by, you can keep adding that dividend on top of the pile for the liquidation preference. Question so, about so do compounding stuff make those all of these go together? Okay. Okay. And the the uh, I'm sorry, I'm just 
still confused. Compounding so compound meaning that let's suppose we get the 8% dividend return share. We get cumulative that let's say the company didn't pay two years, then we get 16% when it's paid. Not on the interest on the 8%, which is compound. So the 2017, we were supposed to get a dividend of 8%. <coughs> If it's cumulative, that's going to stay on the book. And in 2018, we're going to get the, if it gets sold in 2018, we're going to get the value of the 8% that accrued and was allowed to accumulate into 2018. So we're going to get 8% of both. 16%, not, not the interest on the 8%. But if you said that it's cumulative and it's compound, then you're going to get both. You're saying cumulative is not common in the West Coast. It's, it's not. So you only get one time, you only get an 8% once. You don't get it for all the years it's been out. Right. Even yeah. Five why, years why, five. why we're all negotiating it that way, I don't know. Well, when I'm investor side, I, I like compound. So, or at least, a, at least cumulative. Yeah. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. 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 The strikes me as being very peculiar. And I guess I haven't seen it, but only 5% are cumulative on the West Coast, which means that those eight years, you get one time 8%. That's, uh, that's data from a Fenwick and West. Um, so that's that's what I'm looking at as a guideline for myself. Okay. Okay. So, so now let's, uh, let's go ahead. Start with that last bullet. Why is there an income tax liability that is actually tied to another tax. So when we get the promissory notes, we might be down. So is this all through the stock? No, it's only yeah. and this is this is the kind of thing where um, stay stay with me, folks. So uh, all of these terms are gonna be located in the, the charter. So the articles of incorporation, the certificate of incorporation. So remember at the start when the common stock went into existence, the charter was only one page long. When the preferred stock comes into existence, we're going to amend the charter and it's going to now accordion out to about 20, 25 pages because we're going to add all of the preferred stock terms into the charter. So it's going to be baked right in. And that's where the lawyer needs to be careful on looking at the dividend provision to see did we say non cumulative? Did we say cumulative compound? Did we say cumulative simple interest? So that's where you're going to find that. Okay, so the the next yeah, please. I want to go back to your original shelf registration of ten million shares. The authorized shares. Yeah. Authorized shares. Now you've got. Now you're going to issue preferred shares. Does that go against the ten million that are sitting it there? It does. So it's right. a whole new animal. So here's how that's going to play out. Thank you for that question. So well, you're going to. You, you've, got the, you've got the charter. The charter was only one page, and it had 10 million common stock authorized. We're going to amend it before the sale of the preferred stock, because until we amend it, there is no preferred stock. So we're going to amend it, and as soon as we amend it, we're going to say, here's all the rights of the Series A, and now we're going to authorize, we're going to have two authorized numbers, the authorized number of common stock and the authorized number of series A preferred. But the common stock number is going to be higher than the 10 million that's been issued and reserved. Instead, we're going to have to also reserve common stock for if and when the preferred stock converts. So if we have a million worth of preferred, we're going to need to add a million worth of common stock. That was my question. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> okay. So uh, turn to page nine with me, and now we're going to talk. We're going to talk about anti-dilution. Uh, so there's a little bit of math involved here. We can go as slow as we need to go, uh, but I want to make sure that you understand the formulas. So for the founders in the room, anti-dilution protection is not for you. You get all the dilution in the world. <laughs> because, because you're in the cockpit and you're flying the plane. 
the investor is just in aisle 22 and they're hoping we don't hit them out. So they would like to be protected. They, they don't want to be killed when we hit the mountain, but they're willing to get a little scuffed up. So that's what weighted average anti-dilution protection is going to be. And just to, to alleviate the, the fear and the sweats going on probably in the back on, oh my God, we have to take all the dilution. Let me just explain there's good dilution and bad dilution, but bad dilution is good dilution. So watch this. So <laughs> if you have if you have a hundred percent of the shares, you own a company that's worth zero. So you need investor capital in order to grow the company to some value. So in your mind, the company's worth a billion dollars. Uh, but unless the market agrees with you, your company is worth zero. So maybe IBM is willing to buy your company for 10 million. Now, at least in the eyes of one person, your company is worth 10 million. But until the check clears or the wire clears, it's not worth 10 million, it's worth zero. So when an investor like Bruce comes along and says, I'm willing to put in a million dollars on a four million post, what he just said to you is, your company, your pre-money valuation is three million. You add my million on top, now it's post money. The whole company is worth four million after I come in. So you just got diluted. He's buying 25% of your company, one million out of four. Real easy math. Now, you just went from 100% to 75%. Oh, crap. No, 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 no. You went from 100% of nothing to 75% of a company worth $4 million. This is a good day. So that would be good dilution. Bad dilution is he put in the million dollars. The thing was valued at $4 million, And you do a fabulous job of spending his million dollars. And we still have no revenue. And you've hired 20 people and you bought a foosball table and a BMW and, and here we are. So now you need more money. And you call up Bruce and Bruce says, no, I'm not giving you any more money. I'm not telling anybody of Pasadena Angels and you just <laughs> but that never happens to Bruce. We're just we're doing, we're doing <laughs> so you, you managed to run into Joe in the parking lot and Joe says, I don't know what Bruce was smoking, but I'm not giving you a million dollars. I'll tell you what, I'll give you half a million dollars, but I want a million dollar valuation. And you go, Woo. So that means your 75% just got halved. And so, you know, you're sitting in at 37.5% and you're thinking, holy crap, that's terrible dilution. No, it's not. Because you could continue owning 75% of the company, but without Joe's money, it's going to be worth zero. <laughs> so we like massive dilution on a down round if we have no other source and the boat is sinking and there's sharks in the water. So bad dilution is good dilution, and good dilution is good dilution. That's for you. So <laughs> absorb it. Uh, for the rest of the room, for, so now you can, you can put on the sound containment uh, shield. And now we're going to talk about anti-dilution for the angels. So for the angels, like I said earlier, we're in row 22. We, we have no control over the plane. We don't want to have control over the plane. We have other things to do in life. We like to invest and help out. So we would like some protection from dilution. Now here's the thing. We, we do not need protection from good dilution, the first flavor of ice cream. So if Bruce puts in a million at a four million post, he's happy with that valuation. The company needs more money. Bruce is saying we really need some more sophisticated folks in here with the bigger Rolodex. So let me introduce you to Kleiner Perkins. And Kleiner Perkins comes in and says, we're willing to put in 10 million at a 40 million valuation. So now Bruce is gonna get diluted, <laughs> but that's okay because he doesn't have 10 million laying around and he's happy to have Kleiner you know, mighty Kleiner to come in and, and juice this company up. So that's a fantastic thing. Bruce doesn't need to be protected from that. That's positive dilution, okay? So, but what he does want to be protected from is he wants to be protected from Joe. So if the company 
managed not to crash the plane, but we're starting to clip off the tops of trees, that's not, that's not good for Bruce. And so if Joe's willing to give them the emergency financing, but we're going to do a down round, we're going to do a post money valuation less than Bruce's 4 million post, then he wants some protection for that. And the question then is, how much protection is enough protection? And so what the market tells you is that in most situations, you're going to ask for weighted average anti-dilution. Oh my God, what a phrase was that? The other protection you could get is ratchet anti-dilution. I love saying ratchet. It's as, <laughs> it's as nasty as it sounds. Uh, but uh, you're not going to get that, so don't get too excited. So, so what is weighted average anti-dilution? So what we're, what we're trying to figure out is how, what percentage of the company should we own in the event that there's a down round? So Bruce bought in and he got 25% of the company and he's got a per share price of a buck for every share that he bought of his series A. So in comes Joe and Joe's gonna do a B round and Joe's price is 25 cents a share. And he's still getting 25% of the company. So how does that work for Bruce? Well, Bruce no longer 